For generations, people have wondered about the Earth. How can a vast lake deteriorate into a shallow, muddy channel? How are polar glaciers linked to the burning sands of the Sahara Desert? Join us in a search for ice that flows and ancient rivers buried beneath the sands. We'll follow the trail of ancient glaciers, discover relics of the last great ice age, and living monuments to a time when the desert bloomed with lush, green life. Riddles of sand and ice, this time on the Miracle Planet. Ice caves like this are formed from avalanche snow that falls during the long mountain winters. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis for the Miracle Planet. In summer, the deep snow melts back, leaving caves and tunnels where streams flow and waterfalls plunge. There was a time, however, when the snow that fell here did not melt. During the last ice age, a permanent layer of snow and ice covered much of North America and Europe. The frozen blanket affected global weather patterns and formed many of the surface features of the planet we know today. These gigantic slabs of rock stand isolated in a wheat field at the foothills of the Canadian Rockies. They testify to the power of ice. Over 30 feet tall and weighing 20,000 tons, these rocks are not originally from this part of Alberta, Canada. In the middle of one of the world's greatest cities stand out-of-place stone monoliths. These large boulders in New York Central Park are entirely different in composition from the native bedrock of Manhattan. In centuries past, people believed that stones like these were the remnants of a great flood, perhaps even Noah's flood. But by the 19th century, another theory began to gain acceptance. Scientists proposed that the massive boulders, called erratics, were transported from the north to the heart of Manhattan by glacier ice. This action also scraped the island down to bedrock, providing a firm foundation for the skyscrapers that followed. 18,000 years ago, glacier ice was at least 300 feet thick over what is now midtown Manhattan, nearly deep enough to bury the tallest modern towers. Could it happen again? These questions lead us in a journey back to the last ice age. In that time, the northern and central part of the North American continent was frozen under ice in some locations as much as two and a half miles thick. Chicago and New York City would have been buried beneath a massive sheet of ice. But this was just one of at least 10 ice ages that have occurred during the past million years. Today we can get a sense of what the last ice age must have been like 
in Greenland. Even during the present interglacial period, conditions here resembled those of an ice age. Greenland is the largest island in the world, six times the size of California, and mostly covered with glacier ice. The people of this frozen land depend on the sea for their livelihood. During the short summer that melts passages around the island, they fish for cod, lobster, and halibut among the drifting icebergs. Most of Greenland's ice eventually ends up as icebergs, thousands of which float away from the island every year. The glaciers move like frozen rivers as they spread steadily outward. Following this river of ice inland, we find it originates from an immense plateau of solid ice. Greenland is covered with 2,400 trillion tons of ice. And yet even here, not all water is frozen. In this basin, Water from melted snow and ice collects, then plunges over a cataract to vanish beneath the ice sheet. This lake is also made of melted snow. The white bottom reflects the blue color of the sky with unusual fidelity. These meltwater lakes and rivers form on Greenland every summer, resting on an icy bed above the rocky base of the island. In some places, the solid ground of Greenland lies a mile or more beneath the ice. We can explore the depths of Greenland's ice sheet by computer simulation. The image is generated from data provided by satellite observation. Ice covers most of the island, which is over 600 miles wide and 1,500 miles long. Research data gives an unexpected view of the island of rock beneath the sheet of ice. One third of the ground lies below sea level, with the lowest point almost two miles below the surface. The land has been pushed down and scooped out by the ice into a bowl-like shape. Ice has shaped the face of the world since the first rains fell billions of years ago. But it is only recently that scientists have begun to understand the mechanics of glacier movement. A great deal of research into the nature of glaciers takes place in Juneau, Alaska, a town close to numerous glaciers. Here, the front of the Mendenhall Glacier reaches a mere five miles from Alaska's capital. Riding on the surface are rocks, dirt, and bits of debris carried slowly along with the glacier's advance. The crevasses are etched out in part by meltwater, continually flowing through the ice, which melts, freezes, and then melts again.
Following the Mendenhall Glacier back into the mountains, we reach its source, the Juneau Ice Field. 31 miles from east to west and 62 miles north to south, the ice field is the result of snow falling, collecting, and compacting year after year and gradually forming ice. In places, this ice is nearly a mile thick. Here and there, steep mountain peaks rise from the frozen waste. The Greenland Eskimos call them nunataks, lonely stones. Despite the name, they're relatively common in the world's great ice sheets. Noon attacks rise like sentinels, watching over efforts to unlock an icy record of our planet's past. This glacier research camp is operated by scientists from the United States, Canada, and West Germany. Here, glaciologists examine the annual snow accumulation and changes in composition as it ages and compresses. They do this by digging holes in the snowfield. We are looking at the wall of a test pit. One of the scientists who has worked on the Juneau ice field is Professor Maynard Miller of the University of Idaho. Here, one year's accumulation exceeds six meters in depth. This accumulation is comprised not only of snow, but of layers of ice that you see here, uh, intervening between large sections of old snow and another material called fern. Fern is the transitional material from snow to glacier ice, the result of the compression of the snowpack due to its weight and the refreezing of percolating meltwater at depth. This metamorphism is a very important aspect of the growth of a glacier. The accumulated snow has different properties at different depths. These changes can be examined in the wall of snow by descending into a crevasse. Ablation surfaces are above you there. One, two, three, four, five. Five. Dark horizontal bands indicate the transitional layers of fern. They are the result of the snow surface being covered by dust during the summer. Each line marks the top of one year's accumulated snow. Descending further into the crevasse, there is a gradual change in the properties of the snow. This fissure is 80 feet deep. At the lowest point, the fern has been transformed into glacier ice. Snow is just the raw material for creating glacier ice. In the process, the snow gradually changes. To examine the ice, researchers use a special polarizing plate. Under the glass, the crystals of ice appear brightly colored. An ice crystal lying at a depth of 50 feet has a diameter of a tenth of an inch. The black areas are pockets of air. At about 100 feet below the surface, the pressure is three tons per square foot. The ice crystals grow larger, and the air pockets between them become smaller. 
As ice crystals increase in size, they tend to align themselves in the same direction. As the weight of ice above increases, the glacier begins to flow slowly down slope. This is the microscopic basis for the movement of a giant glacier. Enhanced satellite images give us an aerial view of the process around Juno. In winter, the land is buried under a thick blanket of snow. In summer, the snow begins to melt in the low-lying areas and gradually disappears. The snow never melts away completely above an altitude of 3,200 feet, however. It is destined to become glacier ice. Of the 30 glaciers that are fed by the Juno ice field, the largest is the Mendenhall Glacier. It's the blue area in the center. The glacier flows down the slopes of the coast mountains from an altitude of 5,000 feet to nearly sea level. Some ice melts and forms a glacial lake at its leading edge. Around the lake shore are curious hills called terminal moraines. They're composed of the gravel, sand, and clay carried along by the glacier. The moraines and a lake of meltwater are signs that the Mendenhall Glacier has recently retreated. A journey up the glacier reveals evidence of more debris scattered along the path of this river of ice and snow. Among the rocks, there is a strikingly large example six miles from the front of the glacier. Since the Mendenhall flows at a speed of about three feet a day, this gigantic boulder will be carried to the tip of the glacier in about 30 years. Glacial erratics found in New York Central Park or in the wheat fields of Alberta, Canada must have been transported from their points of origin in this manner. During the late 1960s, scientists from the University of Washington captured in time-lapse photography the movement of a glacier over a five-month period. Here in the continuous flow of the glacier, huge masses of ice crack along crevasse lines and finally fall away. The researchers also succeeded in filming the movement of the underside of the glacier. They cut a tunnel six feet in diameter through the side of a glacier 320 feet thick. From within the tunnel, they examined the glacier's movement. The reddish-brown area on the lower left is the bedrock. The white and blue glacier flows slowly appearing to slide over the rock in these unusual time-lapse images. Looking closer, we can see jagged stones broken away from the bedrock. These stones act as the cutting teeth of the glacier, scraping and rasping the bedrock as they pass. The noon attacks that rise steeply from the Juno ice field were sculpted over thousands of years by the action of many glaciers.
Often the sides of these peaks were carved out. Typically, the rock was plucked and ground away until in extreme cases, the force of the glacier either obliterated the mountain or left it standing at sharp angles. Such remnants survive amid a sea of restless ice. At the height of the last ice age, a wintry blanket covered one third of the Earth's land. Today, a warmer climate has melted much of that ice and snow. We are in fact in an age between major glacier advances, when global temperatures have moderated substantially. But still, the surviving glaciers continue to press relentlessly forward. This time-lapse film, five years in the making, shows the movement along a glacier's leading edge. Here it's apparent that ice and debris are steadily being carried down to the sea on what looks like an immense conveyor belt. The ice sheets which once covered half the North American continent must have flowed like this one. Stones of many sizes would have been scraped from the countryside and dragged under the glacier, leaving marks in the land that still remain. Even in Central Park, Surrounded by the tall buildings of New York City, we can find traces of those scars left behind by glaciers of the last ice age. The erratic boulders that stud the park are evidence that a glacier once visited the area. Track marks in the bedrock may tell us about its movement. These gouges were made by the rasping action of rock along the bottom of a huge ice sheet. The grooves testified to the power of the ice and also reveal important information about the direction the ice was moving. One geologist who has studied the phenomenon is Professor Robert Ridke of the University of Maryland. Here we have some very well-developed glacial grooves in this part of the park. Boulders, cobbles, sand, silt and clay working along the base of the glacier over long periods of time helped to carve these nice depressions. All the grooves are parallel to this line that I'm drawing in one of the grooves. By using our compass, we can find that north is over in this direction. And so clearly the ice a thick sheet of ice as it flowed over this part of the park was flowing from the northwest to the southeast, went up over the bedrock, and flowed to the lower end of Manhattan. Tracing the route of the glaciers that covered southern New York back toward their point of origin, we come first to the Finger Lake region of upstate New York. Here, just south of Lake Ontario, the land is marked by long gouges like the scratches of a giant hand. Altogether, there are 11 members of the Finger Lake group, ranging from 3 to 35 miles in length. As this satellite photo shows, the lakes are oriented fan-like, along a north-south axis. The ice sheets carve deep trenches into the soft shale native to the region. Later, after the ice had melted back, the narrow valleys filled with water and became the Finger Lakes.
Further north, the trail of the ancient glacier continues. In Canada, heading toward the Arctic Circle, the north woods thin and the coniferous trees become smaller before giving way to the open tundra. Here too are many small lakes. Although they differ in shape from the Finger Lakes, these lakes were also gouged out by the glaciers. As the glacier receded, it left behind numerous erratics. Here the glaciers have played a trick on gravity. Rocks which once lay on top of the ice were left in a variety of seemingly precarious positions when the ice melted away and returned them to solid ground. Here, the glacier was about a mile and a half thick at the culmination of the last ice age. The weight of the ice was so great it depressed the land beneath it and cut grooves into the bedrock of the Canadian Shield, the most ancient part of the North American continent. Glacial action here has been vigorous enough to strip the region of most topsoil. This, combined with the cold northern climate, has made it one of the world's most extensive desolate regions. We are now 745 miles north of New York City. The grooves point still further to the northeast. This is near the source of the former ice sheet. In fact, in the eastern half of the continent, most of the glacial marks point toward one area in northeastern Canada. The source of the glaciers is an extensive plateau called the Labrador Ungava Peninsula. The journey, which began in New York Central Park, has brought us to a desolate subarctic tableland. The great ice sheet that covered the eastern region of North America less than 20,000 years ago originated here. Today, the land is largely flat, except for valleys like this, which betray its glacial past. These deep clefts were carved out by a glacier. Their U-shaped profile is characteristic of glacial valleys the world over. During the summer, the rocky ground of the Labrador and Gava Plateau appears briefly. But someday, giant glaciers may once again flow across this vast land, because on Earth, Ice Age glaciers advance and retreat with changes in the Earth's orbit. Responding to the gravitational pull of the Sun, the Moon, and the other planets of the solar system, the Earth's orbit very gradually changes. It evolves from almost circular to more elliptical, and then back to more circular, here greatly exaggerated. On and on the cycle goes, 
slowly moving back and forth between the two extremes over 100,000 year intervals. When the Earth's orbit becomes more elliptical, it receives less sunlight in the outer perimeter and may become slightly cooler. The temperature of the Earth is also affected by changes in the planet's inclination. Today, the Earth's axis is inclined at about 23 degrees, but that angle increases and decreases across 40,000 year intervals. This change can dramatically influence conditions on Earth. When the inclination of the Earth's axis becomes large, the sun's warming rays beat down more directly on a region in a high latitude like the Labrador and Gava Plateau. More of the sun's energy is concentrated on the region, causing a general warming trend with especially hot summers. On the other hand, when the inclination becomes small, the plateau has colder summers because it receives less solar energy. About 115,000 years ago, the Earth approached its maximum elliptical orbit, and at the same time, the axis was at the smallest possible angle of inclination. The Labrador and Gava Plateau was about to greet the first of many cold summers. Oddly enough, the arrival of an ice age was triggered not by cold winters, but by unusually cold summers. The distant sun rose in the summer sky, but it was closer to the horizon and gave less warmth. On the northern plateau, the sun's rays did not melt all the winter snow. The surface of the white snow reflected the sun's warming energy back away from the earth. As snow covered areas increased, the amount of solar energy absorbed by the earth's surface decreased and the temperature dropped. This phenomenon is known as the albedo effect. Albedo is a measure of reflectivity, in this case, of the land surface. Over time, the albedo effect made the cold tableland even colder, as more of the Earth's surface was covered with snow that reflected solar radiation back into space. In contrast, the sea maintained its warmth much longer than the land, because it has a lower albedo, that is, it's less reflective. Warm currents are carried far across the oceans. This is the Gulf Stream, bringing warm water from the equatorial region past the coast of Labrador. When there's a great difference between the temperature of land and sea, a particular weather pattern occurs. It begins when the cold air over Labrador encounters warm moist air moving north from the Gulf of Mexico. The warm air cools and forms clouds, which in turn drop a great deal of precipitation on Labrador in the form of snow. During the Ice Age, when summers were colder, these conditions continued for unusually long periods. Once this process started and snow began to accumulate, the tendency toward more snowfall became even greater. the retracting more snow from the warm, moist air. The process continued for thousands of years, and in the process, many glaciers were born. Under the accumulating weight, the lower layers of snow turned to ice. As the snow accumulated, 
the growing ice sheet began to flow under the power of its own cold weight. The white world spread and another ice age had begun. On the North American continent, one great eastern ice sheet spread toward the Hudson Bay area. Another formed over the rugged mountains of western Canada. These glaciers combine briefly to form a huge ice sheet almost two and a half miles thick, reaching from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The Eurasian continent also developed a similar sheet of ice, and before long, one third of the Earth's land was buried under glaciers. Over the last million years, the Earth has experienced at least 10 distinct ice ages separated by relatively short warm spells. These ice ages dramatically altered global weather patterns. Northern regions that are now the world's breadbasket were locked in the grip of frigid winters and cold summers. Shifts in the climate eventually brought life-giving rains to some dry desert regions. One area that was transformed in this way is the Sahara Desert. Tassili Najer is located in the middle of the Sahara Desert. But there is much evidence here of a land that was once green and well watered. The name Tassili Najer means plateau of flowing rivers, and indeed many old river courses and canyons can be found in the rock. Water carved the stone towers and other formations by eroding the relatively soft sandstone. There is also considerable evidence of wind erosion here in the pitted surfaces of the exposed rock. Because of its weight, the sand cannot easily rise above the ground more than a few yards so this erosion is limited to the lower walls. But the signs of water erosion are widely visible on the walls. Further evidence that water once flowed here has been discovered by satellite observation. In November 1981, the space shuttle trained a special side-scan radar device on the Sahara Desert. This instrument emitted a signal that could pass through the desert sands because of the uniformity and dryness of the sand grains. The experiment was designed to examine the structure that lies beneath the surface. The radar penetrated to a depth of almost 20 feet. The images that emerged from the 27 mile wide scan of the Sahara were surprising. Underneath the smooth sand layer, many ancient drainages and floodplains appeared. In fact, there were many river systems, some as big as the Nile, when the Sahara enjoyed intervals of a wetter climate. From a blazing desert to a green watered land and back again, the face of the Sahara has changed many times. On this rock wall, there are more clues to the Sahara's wetter climate which followed the last ice age. People created many wall paintings between 6,000 and 2,000 years ago.
They tell us much about the changing lifestyle of the people who occupied the region. And they give us a glimpse of the changing Sahara itself. The most recent picture is of a camel, which suggests a dry climate like the one today. Prior to this period, the wall painters depicted different animals. Perhaps wishing for an abundance of livestock, ancient farmers painted many cows around them. Here we see cattle grazing, people cooking and chopping wood. Significantly, people are shown caring for their animals. These people were herdsmen. And this is the inside of a native home. The dark image is a central bed surrounded by walls. These are the paintings of a people who are becoming settled. But before this time, the wall paintings show nomadic hunters pursuing now extinct beasts. The age of these animal paintings indicates that as long as 12,000 years ago, the post-Ice Age Sahara must have been a green world where people lived among trees, flowers, and flowing streams. The climatic changes at Tassili Najer are the result of fluctuations in the two great dry belts that circle the globe above and below the equator. As the polar ice caps expand and contract due to variations in the Earth's orbit and tilt, the dry belts move accordingly and influence the size and location of the deserts. Let's look more closely at the situation in the Sahara and its relationship to the polar ice caps. Around 18,000 years ago, the glacier ice reached its maximum coverage, both in the northern and southern hemisphere. The dry belts were then pushed toward the equator. This gave areas in the northern Sahara, like Tassili Najer, a wetter and more moderate climate, similar to what the Mediterranean enjoys today. But as the Earth's orbit continued to change slowly, the glaciers began to retreat. Responding to this change, the dry band of the Sahara expanded gradually northward to the shores of the Mediterranean. At the close of the Ice Age, the general warming trend brought life-giving rains into the southern Sahara. Streams flowed, and the Sahara became a broad savanna where life could flourish. But as the Earth's orbit continued to shift, the climate of this region once again became drier. In historical times, the southern limits of the desert have fluctuated, first north, then south, occasionally bringing severe drought to inhabited areas. Even today, the desert is still spreading south, and it's hard to imagine a time when cool streams flowed in the Sahara. Living proof of that long-vanished Sahara still remains. This cypress tree is one of the few survivors from the time when the Sahara was green. It sprouted over 4,000 years ago, before the rise of ancient Egypt. The glaciers had long receded, but rains still fell in the Sahara. The ancient animals and the men who pursued them gradually vanished from Tassili Najer. The giant old tree, rooted deep in the desert soil, has survived the changing face of the Sahara. But here in the southern Sahara, there is evidence of a different force within the earth itself that also has changed this land from desert to forest to desert again. These are the petrified remains of trees that grew in the Sahara 100 million years ago. Over time, each cell of the tree has been replaced with silica, preserving the shape in the form of rock. 
Some of these petrified trees measure 65 feet in length, testifying to the well-watered nature of this region during the age of the dinosaurs. These long-term changes in the African climate result from continental drift. While the dry belts have moved north and south due to changes in the Earth's orbit, the continents have moved as well. 200 million years ago, the region we know as the Sahara Desert was quite far from its present location. Africa was located much closer to the South Pole. Driven north by the process of plate tectonics, the heart of the Sahara first passed through the dry belt region of the southern hemisphere. 100 million years ago, the Sahara reached the tropical region of the equator. In that age, tall trees grew, covering the land with great forests. But it would not remain a lush region. Very slowly, the Sahara moved into the northern hemisphere's dry belt, bringing a general return to desert conditions. These have been heightened over the last 5,000 years by a gradual shift in the dry belt itself. The most dramatic changes can be seen along the southern fringe of the Sahara. Not long ago, this area was the bottom of Lake Chad. These people are going fishing. A pier is located near their village, but the water no longer reaches it. Now they have to haul their boats to the lake shore. About 30 minutes travel by car from the village, there's a fish market located on a withered arm of the lake. People come here from around the region to buy fish caught in Lake Chad. A waterway leads to what is left of the lake. Along this section of the channel, boats must pass closely in the shallow water. Fishermen are numerous. They compete for the fish that remain in this narrowing passage. Stringing their lines, they float along, hoping for a strike. After an hour of paddling, the waterway narrows to a shallow channel of muddy water. Some of these travelers were on their way back from Lake Chad. To reach this point, it was a four-day journey from the present shores of the lake. They say that Lake Chad was here just one and a half months ago. The water level in this South Saharan lake is falling that fast. The process is particularly evident in these false color satellite photographs. The red images are vegetation. In 1973, Lake Chad was as big as the state of New Jersey. Because it is such a broad, shallow lake with no drainage outlet, Lake Chad is greatly affected by evaporation, which is more powerful in this part of Africa than anywhere else in the world. The geologic record reveals that the water level has fluctuated widely in the past, but never more than it has during the last two decades.
In 1982, nine years after the first photograph, half of the north side of the lake has changed to a reddish brown color. This indicates that much of the lake is drying up, replaced by growing plants. Swamps are the black areas, and only the southern part of the lake remains. As the months pass, the swamps continue to dry up. In 1984, the swamps have all but disappeared, and the lake has diminished to one-tenth of its former size. Global forces are at work, as Lake Chad is being claimed by the expanding Sahara Desert. This is a unique period in the evolution of our world's climate. Two contradictory forces are at work. One is a natural cycle. The other, a result of human activity. Natural changes in the Earth's orbit suggest that over the long term, our planet will be getting colder. We are slowly heading for another ice age. And yet the Earth is showing signs of a short-term warming trend that may be due to carbon dioxide building up in the atmosphere. This is the increasing greenhouse effect, which has come about since the Industrial Revolution, chiefly as a result of burning enormous amounts of fossil fuels. So though we may be heading slowly for another ice age, we are now in a warming trend, influenced by humanity. Global weather patterns are changing, and in some areas, the deserts are spreading. We can see the deserts advancing today in places like Mauritania. A few thousand years ago, this South Saharan country contained many small, shallow lakes. Today, most are dry and live on only in the language and place names. One such place is Nouakchott, the capital of Mauritania. The suffix chat refers to a salt lake that has long since vanished. This is the edge of Nouakchott today the bleak destination for thousands of refugees fleeing the expanding desert. It, too, has been overrun by blowing sands. In lulls between the windy blasts, people begin to build their houses. They dig a hole in the sand to support a post. To keep the hole from caving in, they harden it with drops of precious water, which now must be drawn from deep wells. This is life today in the South Sahara, as people try to hold on in the face of a world that is growing ever more hostile. We don't know how far the Sahara Desert will spread or when it will begin to retreat. But one thing is certain, the face of our planet is continually changing. For billions of years, natural forces have brought frozen glaciers and arid deserts. Now through our actions, we are becoming a global force to change the face of our miracle planet.